I wonder sometime after 45 years on the island why I'm here and how I got here. And I have to look back to the summer of 1972 when I was doing a census of all the barrier islands off northern Alaska and happened to visit Cooper Island. And you have to be careful who and what you fall in love with in your 20s because um, I found a small colony of black guillemots here and came back to study that colony. And then once it got some momentum, uh, it just kept going. All of a sudden, it became clear that my findings on the one island uh, tie in very much with what's happening with global warming. And you thought, oh, this is a little trend, but you never expect the trend to go the way it has gone, because you think, wait a minute, if that keeps going, that's going to mean that it's going to get too warm to have ice and snow up here, which means that the Arctic is no longer the Arctic, which is still, for me, uh, almost incomprehensible. Having been out here for the bulk of my life, what I knew every summer is that I would be coming back to this island to study the biology of the species and also experience the Arctic and have that be my life for three months um, and not be on the grid, not be driving a car, um, and unfortunately not even taking a shower. This is a place that is a constant in my life and gives me some stability. But uh, from the first days of the study, um, the isolation that I experienced and that is necessary for being uh, on Cooper Island and gathering the data on the Black Guillemots is something that had its costs. Many of my friends have gotten married and I have missed all the weddings. And I realized uh, recently that I've missed many of my weddings because the, the people that I had intended to marry went on with the wedding and luckily found someone who could stand in for me uh, to, be, to, be, to be the groom so that, so that I didn't get married during what should have been my wedding. Much of the time over the past 44 years, I have, and it's gotten to be more common recently, I wake up and I look around and go, wait a minute, it's 2019. In the 70s and throughout the 80s, I could come out here by snow machine over sea ice up until almost mid-June. Now one can't do that because the ice is breaking up starting as early as late May. And like any long-term relationship, you don't really appreciate something until it's gone. Suddenly, a place that used to be mainly white and then always had the ice just offshore, it's like blue water to the horizon. There's been this major decline the ice that used to be close to shore is now hundreds of miles offshore. I see these birds that I've known for so long struggling to deal with the fact that they have a very different universe than they had in the 70s and 80s and early 90s when, when I was first out here. Black guillemots, the species of seabird I'm studying, this is a species that's adapted to the high Arctic. It isn't migratory. Guillemots have the problem of having predators that will take their eggs and chicks, so they have to breed in cavities. And the fact that I landed on an island that had no natural cavities, and I found 17 nests that first year, I thought, well, this is pretty amazing, because they really just have used wooden boxes that the, that the Navy happened to drop off there in the 1950s. And I thought, well, this is excellent. I could just put up more boxes and have a nice colony I can study in a way that I couldn't study most other seabirds. For the first few decades, um, I was just the, the somewhat strange person on the island studying this population of birds. And I am following their mating and breeding habits uh, every year. I'm out here alone for much of the summer, and I'm experiencing all the data on a day-to-day -day basis at a level that is very different than most climate change scientists. 
This is heightened by the fact that birds that I have banded as chicks have come back to breed here for up to 33 years. So I've had this connection with the colony that was so uh, exciting to find. It was the first record of black guillemots breeding in the area that I thought, well, this is really something, and it's also something that no one else was doing. I go out and walk through the colony, and I go through these nest checks, going up to the site, seeing that it's okay, and peeking in to see who's back at each nest site. I look at the color bands on the birds and write that down. If there are eggs in the nest, if there's a parent bird attending them, if they've been incubated for a while to see if those eggs have hatched. Um, and then once the chicks are hatched in August, when I visit a nest, I take the chicks out of the nest and weigh them uh, and measure them so I can look at their growth rates. My data showed the fact that the spring was getting warmer and birds were laying their eggs earlier and many of the chicks uh, are dying and, and they're certainly growing at a slower rate. So however widespread guillemots used to be, whereas in the past 10% of the chicks might die in the nest, now up to 60% of them would die. I mean, over the past two decades, as it's become clear that I am studying the canary in the coal mine, I think about what canaries in the coal mine were meant to do. They were meant to be a warning. Once you see that the canary is under stress or close to dying, you, you realize we might be under stress. So it's meant to be an indicator that humans need to do something. One could expect now, based on what we're seeing on Cooper, this is now an important data set for something that's happening globally. I didn't want to study climate change. Climate change found this study and found me and said, okay, you are no longer doing the standard bird study. You're now studying the fact that the Arctic is melting. I met George Devoki 18 years ago in 2001. I was assigned by a major magazine to take a look at George and his bird studies. One of the main reasons I came back up to Cooper was to recreate a photograph I did with George back in 2001. In that photograph, he's standing on solid ice framed by the Arctic sky. George has told me that if he went back to that exact same spot and stood there for a photograph, he would be up to his waist in water. Anybody home? Cheryl. Dude, what are you doing, man? 18 years. 18 years. 18 years. I knew you'd come back. <laughs> you said you'd come back. I did say it, and I, I meant it. It took a while. It took a while, but... Yeah. You've but made some improvements. Yeah, the yeah. cabin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, why don't you come inside and take a load off? All right, thanks, man. You know, as a photographer, you shoot thousands and thousands of pictures. Only a few stick to you, you know, really. That photograph that we made on the ice all those years ago has been one of those photographs. When I first saw it, uh, I was just blown away. It captured so much. It just brings me a great deal of pleasure, and your work has played a major part in this. It is nice that I'm noticed as someone who's doing work that's important. Uh, it makes all the, all the difference to me. Yeah. And what we're going to do is recreate that one photograph. What are we up against? Well, you and I were walking down to North Beach, and there was this great light to the north. And you said, hey, could you stand out there on the ice a little bit? I'll get a picture of you. And neither of us had any idea no. what that would mean in no. terms of that image and things like that. Now, the North Beach uh, has water from the beach out to probably 400 miles. So having me be where I was standing, but that spot is now, it's open ocean. 
And, and again, to have that major change, and even back then, if you look at the models of how sea ice was going to disappear, nobody predicted this rate of loss. The speed of it is astonishing. Yeah, the speed. People were saying, by the end of the century, sea ice may be gone. And now they're saying, maybe in six years it'll be gone. Do you ever think about, if you were not on the island, how small the colony might oh, be? Oh, I know. Well, no, see, that's it. Like, if I hadn't you know, pursued it, it would have been, you know, I mean, it would have, it would have been maybe 25 pairs. And when the polar bears showed up, it would have been wiped out. It's just remarkable, I mean, because you've, you've helped these birds adapt. Yes. George is a remarkable individual, incredibly tenacious. What he's chosen to do in the face of this gloom and doom that we hear about all the time in terms of global warming, is he's chosen to focus on the specific elements that are in front of him, to educate all of us and give us hope for the future that we could turn this thing around. This exact spot used to be ice 18 years ago. This isn't a computer module or an algorithm or a prediction. This is real life. George has seen it and experienced it. He's worthy of a photograph, and I'm proud to take it. <laughs> so, what do you think? That's it. That's the picture. You got it. I am hoping that my legacy will be that I gathered this data set that uh, certainly helped some people see that climate change was happening and that there was a study that was started in 1975 of a thriving seabird colony in Arctic Alaska and the colony is now facing extinction and that happened in one researcher's lifetime. Because the longest uh, study of an Arctic seabird, <clears throat> the longest continuous study of an Arctic seabird, uh, is a very important resource. And um, it's being seen that way by more and more people. And uh, it's, it, it is just too valuable for it to end, uh, no matter what might happen to me, um, if, it, if it continues to monitor something as important as climate change. I have hope that many species and most importantly, humans will get to the point where they'll go, you know, we need to be able to change what we're doing because of these changes in our environment. All right, be well, man. Okay. Be well. Well, All right. I'm going to see you again in five years. In out five here. years, I'm going to hold you to that. The 50th. Yes. All right. For sure. All right, stay okay. safe. Yeah. Safe travels. Thanks, man. The two or three times when I almost didn't come back to keep the study going, the reason I did was because of my personal connection to the island, because my experience has made it so much a part of my life. What I really hope, to the extent that I set up any sort of thing that can be maintained in the future, it'll be like, yes, somebody needs to go back to Cooper Island every summer and see who's trying to breed and ban any chicks that are fledged from that island so that the study can be maintained. <laughs>